Hello everyone, this is Father Kevin Linnaeus. I want to welcome you here to this presentation. This is the first of three presentations um, that we'll be giving here at St. Stephen's Catholic Church on some hot button issues. Um, starting here uh, with abortion, we'll then go on to, in our next presentation, on the uh, Catholic Church's teaching on same-sex attraction and LGBTQ+. And then finally, we'll be looking at the Church's teaching on transgenderism. So certainly some, some big topics to talk about a lot of times that are greatly misunderstood in terms of what does the Catholic Church actually teach. So today in this presentation, we're hoping to look at the teaching of the Church on abortion. Now it's no secret that the, church, the Catholic Church is against abortion in every single circumstance. The reason we want to give this presentation is not really to proclaim something new, certainly not, but rather to give a more in-depth understanding of why the church uh, teaches that every single abortion is wrong, and also to be able to equip us to be able to explain that to other people. This is very important because, like I said, I think most people in our culture, in our country, are going to know that the Catholic Church teaches this, but it's good for us to be able to understand why. And so to begin, when we look at the church's teaching on abortion, we have to understand that abortion always comes out of some type of difficult situation. I uh, gave this presentation live uh, on a Thursday night, um, and so I'm able to do it here. But one thing I said on, on Thursday night was that abortion, like I said, never comes out of a good situation, right? Um, so even, um, I would imagine, many, many pro-choice people um, and I've heard this from many pro-choice people to say that um, abortion is not something that they like. Um, and while it may be lifted up as a woman's rights issue and that, that they would see that as a very good thing, that abortion is not something beautiful. The reason I'm coming at this is, is to say that we have to understand that when somebody chooses to have an abortion, it's usually coming, uh, that choice is made out of a out of something of woundedness or a feeling of being trapped, uh, victimhood, um, somebody that's not ready to be a mother. Um, there are a lot of factors that play into a, a very heavy choice like this, and so we have to understand that. So the first thing, the first thing I want to show here and really talk about is, can we understand pro-choice arguments? This is very important, especially when we're looking at any type of um, in any, when we're entering into any type of discussion with others, um, especially about these uh, hot topic, uh, hot button issues, that we have to be able to understand where other people are coming from. This is very, very important. And so, some political arguments that can be given for why abortion should be held. Number one, abortion gives women the same rights and freedoms that men have. Now, according to this argument, it says, federally protected abortion offers women the opportunity to fully realize their goals and dreams in the same way that a man can do. Men do not have to worry about becoming pregnant, and they do not face the same consequences of an unplanned pregnancy as women do. An abortion allows a woman to walk away from an unborn child, just as a man would be able to do. So there is an understanding there of, of kind of a political argument that abortion can put women on the same level as of men in terms of um, responsibility and reaction and choices in terms of pregnancy. Another political argument would be that abortion gives a woman full autonomy over her body, that she is able to choose what happens to her body. The legalization of abortion gives a woman full freedom over her body, according to this way of thinking, which includes the freedom to terminate an unwanted pregnancy. There are many possible health-related risks associated with pregnancy. And the possible complications connected with bringing a child to full term can have long-lasting effects, or if case, as we know, sometimes uh, have a fatal outcome. Advancements in contraceptives and safe methods of conducting an abortion have given women greater autonomy over their bodies. Again, this, uh, this method is saying that there's a, this level of safety and autonomy, and that the, the woman has the right to her body. Now, can we understand that? Much of this, so a woman has a right to her body and to protect herself, we would agree with 100%. Another political argument of why abortion should be legal. 
abortion gives a woman full autonomy over her life. This kind of follows from the, from the, the other argument that every woman has the right to exercise the full breadth of her personal autonomy and determine for herself what kind of life she wants to live. This, inclu uh, excuse me, this includes the choice of becoming a mother, and that if she doesn't want to be a mother, she's not ready to be a mother, she's not going to be forced to become a mother. Some other um, arguments is that um, abortion gives pregnant mothers the option to protect their unborn child from poverty, abuse, or neglect. There can, the, the issue can be raised that is it just to bring a child into a situation that is you knowingly this child is going to grow up either because they're uh, they're going to grow up to, because of a handicap, um, they're going to have a difficult life, they're going to be born into poverty, they're going to be born into um, a home where they're not wanted. Would it not be more just to terminate that pregnancy so that it's more fair to the child that they would never have to experience that hardship? Now. The main thing I wanted to show here, and when we did our live presentation, our youth minister, Noe, did a wonderful job of explaining these. But what we wanted to show was that, do you see from these arguments that there is a lot of good there? That's where I want to start. There's so much good there. Um, now, there's, of course, many, many things that we as Catholics disagree with. But we have to start with common ground. And this common ground being, primarily in many of these arguments, is the well-being and the protection of the woman. We believe in women's rights just as anybody else does. In fact, even more so, uh, according, you know, in, in my opinion, uh, and to, according to the opinion of the church, is that we are here to be able to protect women and that we are on the same page in some respects with those who have um, who hold uh, to the pro-choice um, side of this argument, that um, we are here to provide for women, we want to make sure that they're doing well, um, but we need to understand these arguments and understand primarily, and this is really where I'm getting getting to, is that we cannot demonize people that we disagree with. Many people on the pro-choice side of things. And I would say even rightly have accused pro-life people of saying it's all about the baby, it's all about the baby, we don't care about the mother. If somebody has that approach to a pro-life argument, that would not be pro-life. That would, that would be, um, or, or it would be perceived as not being pro-life. We need to be careful that we don't demonize the other side. And that we understand that many of their arguments are coming from places of, of goodness, that they want to protect women, that they want to um, uh, put women on an equal playing field with men, according to that one argument, um, and that they're trying to be just to these, uh, perhaps these, these babies that may be born into difficult circumstances. A lot of that comes from a place of goodness we would simply say that that goodness is a bit misplaced. And now we want to kind of look at what do, how do we respond to some of these arguments? And primarily, what I want to focus on today in this presentation, what I want to focus on today in this presentation is what does it mean to be a person? Because primarily this is what the argument comes down to, right? Is that um, we believe that at the moment of conception, that that is a brand new person. Many pro-choice, there, there's, there's different levels, and I can't speak for them all, but there's different levels of understanding of the pro-choice argument. But, but one of the primary ones, I would argue, would be um, that we would say, or the pro-choice person would say that, um, that the unborn child, at whatever stage they claim, is not a person but a clump of cells. We would say something completely different. That from the moment of conception, this is the beginning of life, and thus the beginning of personhood. So let's look at, how would do we define this? What do we say, how would you describe a human being? How would you define, rather, a human being? This is how the Catechism of the Catholic Church takes a look at this. Paragraph 355, 
God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And man occupies a unique place in creation. Then it gives four um, subsets, sub, four reasons to further explain this. Number one, a person is in the image of God. Number two, in his own nature, he unites the spiritual and material worlds. This is one huge tenet of the Catholic teaching is that we are, in some ways, as human beings, we are the pinnacle of God's creation. So that we are not just animals who don't have rational souls, nor are we angels who are just spirits, but rather we are both united together. That in our nature, we unite the spiritual and the material into one. This is very important of understanding what it means to be a person. Number three, he has created male and female. Um, that we see this from the beginning. This will, of course, be very um, important as we continue our talks in, uh, with same-sex attraction with transgenderism. And finally, number four, that God established him in his friendship. The primary thing that we want to see here is that number two, in his own nature, he unites the spiritual and material worlds. That man is both body and soul. But following from that, let's look at what does it mean to be created in the image of God. To be created in the image of God doesn't mean that we look, uh, or God, you know, has uh, two two arms and two legs, and like He does here in the, this very famous painting of Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel. Of course, this is an artist rend rendering. Um, you know, we be believe God, aside from Jesus having a human nature, God does not have a gender. God does not. Um, God is not a human being um, in 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 within the Trinity. So what does it mean to be created in the image of God? From Genesis, God created man in his own image. Male and female, he created them. To be created in the image of God, or in Latin we would say in the imago Dei, the image of God, would mean that we are created with the capacity to love. We are created with the capacity to understand transcendental spiritual things. God himself is love. God is relationship. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. The Father loves the Son. The Son loves the Father. And the Holy Spirit is the love shared between them too. God is relationship in himself. And when we are created in his image, that means that we, built into our very DNA, built into our very nature of who we are as a person, means that I have the capacity of entering into deep relationship and that I was made for relationship, and I was made for eternal love. God is love. We reflect He who made us. God is love, and we reflect that. We have the capacity to enter into that. So being a human being, being made in the image of God, like we said, we unite the spiritual and the material um, aspects of creation. So man is both body and soul. So what I want to do right now is look at um, these two and really define what does the Catholic Church teach about the body? What does the Catholic Church teach and how does she define the soul? And this will help us to understand what does it mean to be a person? This is from the Catechism, uh, paragraph 362. The Catechism says, the human person, created in the image of God, is a being at once corporeal and spiritual, as we said earlier. The biblical account expresses this reality in symbolic language when it affirms that then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. and Man became a living being. Man, whole and entire, is therefore willed by God. So we see again that we are these two, um, body and soul, a union of the two, and that they can't be separated um, in the sense of what does it mean to be a human being. Now you may wonder what happens at death when our soul leaves our body. We'll talk about that. We would say that that's a, a radical rupture, that that is something unnatural to, um, 
to being a, 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 a person, to being a, a human being. So what we see from this is that the body is good and holy. This is actually a huge teaching of the Catholic Church. We believe, you know, the body is not something bad or nasty or disgusting, or rather, um, or, you know, nor is it something, uh, something a heresy that we would call Gnosticism, which would say that, um, you know, we are really just souls who are trapped in bodies, and that the whole idea is to be released, you know, when I shed this mortal coil, as the saying goes, to be released from my body, and then I'll be truly free. No, we don't believe that. Um, we believe that the body is good and holy, and it was completely willed by God. Um, you know, and I, of course I have the, these, uh, these images here, and you, you may be shocked that, oh my gosh, you know, we Father Kevin put nudity on his presentation. Well, no. Oh, I mean, yes, I did. But, um, but to look at it here, that again, that the body is good and holy. There's uh, the, um, the, the common history is that when uh, Pope John Paul II was elected Pope, that, um, you know, before he, he, uh, before he was Pope, in the Sistine Chapel, you know, there, there's lots of nudity uh, in, the, in that sacred artwork. And uh, many people, I can't remember if previous popes had either actually pinned loincloths or painted loincloths over, over these people. And John Paul II came in and said, no, take them down. We're not, we're not hiding something. Um, the body is created by God, and the body speaks of something greater. And this is what he says. Here's a few quotes from John Paul II about the body. He says, Man, whom God created male and female, bears the divine image imprinted on his body. Man and woman constitute two different ways of the human being a body in the unity of that image. I mean, so, so look, look here, you know, that we have, you know, frankly, putting it frankly, the male body makes no sense on its own. The female body makes no sense on its own, but together they have the capacity to become one. And that is something good and holy. The marital embrace is, is something um, both physical, natural, but also something supernatural. Um, and it, and the, the teaching of the church, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you know, sex is something that we should keep on the side um, or that it's not very good. No, rather we believe this is something extremely holy because we bear the divine image imprinted on our bodies, meaning, as we said, to be um, in the image of God, meaning that um, you have the capacity, uh, human beings, rather, have the capacity of entering into relationship, both on a physical and a, and a uh, spiritual level. Let's continue on with another quote from John Paul II. These quotes are from his Theology of the Body. The body and it alone is capable of making visible what is invisible, the spiritual and the divine. It was created to transfer into the visible reality of the world the mystery hidden since time immemorial in God, and thus to be a sign of it. So you see, your body is not something that was just that's just there, that's just given to you. Um, as John Paul II says, the body is brings um, it makes visible what is invisible. These great spiritual truths of love, of peace, of justice, all of this is acted through the body. And even just an objective sense, when you look at the male body and the female body, that it proclaims something on its own. Like I said, the male body makes no sense on its own. The female body makes no sense on its own. But together, they proclaim something. And even, a, even um, by themselves, they proclaim that they are made for someone else. They are made to be, um, they, they cannot survive on their own. They're not meant just to survive on their own. So this again, we are created in the image of God. We are created in the capacity for having relationship. That's the Imago Dei, the image of God. And our bodies proclaim that. There's the sanctity about it. So of course, to be a human being comes in two different ways. That to be a human person, it can either be done in the masculine or in the feminine, two different ways of being a body. And so, in conclusion of this kind of section, what have we come to see about the body is that we believe the body reveals the person. Now, that's a very, very important point 
that the Catholic Church holds. The body reveals the person. You know, when you um, look at somebody, uh, or rather, when you talk about somebody, when you conjure up, you know, think about your, your old, uh, you know, your old Aunt uh, Gertrude or something, and you're talking about her over the dinner table, you're not thinking of some abstract form of Aunt Gertrude, right? Just um, you're thinking about her, her face, her body. The body reveals the person, and that way it's so good and holy. Another thing is that it objectively expresses who the individual is. Just like I said of, you know, old Aunt Gertrude here. It objectively, her body expresses who she is. That's how you know her. Um, our culture today takes this, uh, is going to take this and, and, and flip it upside down, that the person reveals the body, that the person gets to define what to do with the body. We would say that's against nature, that rather the body reveals the person. And finally, we come to this conclusion, we are our bodies. Again, a huge mistake that our culture makes, um, and that many of us make too, is, is, is thinking that um, we are simply, in, we, we are just souls that are trapped in bodies. No, you are your body. To be a human being, being as, we've, um, as we've put down, is to be both body and soul together. And in fact, when somebody dies, God never wanted death. Death entered the world because of, uh, because of sin, uh, because of disobedience, a natural consequence to that. That, um, that when body and soul are separated, like I said earlier, this is what we would call a radical rupture. That when a soul is separated from their body, they are not, that's not a human being. It's a human soul, but it's not a human being. Because to be a human being means body and soul together as one thing. Um, and so, and, and that's why we believe as Catholics, we profess in the creed, I believe in the resurrection of the body. I believe in the resurrection of the dead. We believe that in heaven we will be reunited with our bodies, our glorified bodies. Uh, because this is, um, this is what we see when we see Jesus risen from the dead. He doesn't appear as a spirit or as a ghost or just his soul. He appears in his body. And still has the, the nail marks, the wounds in his hands. Um, and that he lives in this body in a glorified state. So you are your body. And that's very important to understand that. Now, now we want to look at what is the soul. We've looked a little bit about what the church teaches about the body. But now, what is the soul? Now it's really interesting. The soul is... Um, is, you know, kind of our, our pop culture notion of the soul would be kind of, you know, Casper the Ghost kind of thing. That, um, you know, there is this really thin, filmy wisp of air kind of inside of me, and that when I die, it floats away from my body, and it kind of looks like me, and it's ghosty. Um, you know, that, that's kind of the image that we all have in our head just because of popular culture. Um, but of course we know the soul is not a physical thing. And so it's hard for us, uh, who are most used to describing things in a physical way, and to understanding things through our senses, it's hard for us to describe the soul. But we're going to attempt that here and kind of look at what does the Catholic Church say the soul is. And again, this will be very, very important when we begin to look at the Church's teaching on abortion and what defines a person, what defines a human being. So let's go back to the Enlightenment. A philosopher named René Descartes, uh, very famous Enlightenment philosopher, uh, modern contemporary, or excuse me, uh, modern philosopher. Um, his famous quote that you may be familiar with is, I think, therefore I am. Now Descartes was doing something, he was trying to kind of wipe the slate clean of philosophy and kind of start from the ground up. Um, and and I, I only studied him a little bit, I cannot speak a lot of Descartian theory, if that's how you say it. Um, but this is his famous line, I think, therefore I am. And this has kind of taken hold of our uh, popular culture notion of what does it mean to be a person. Begins with me, I think, therefore I am. Rather, the Catholic Church would come at this in her philosophy of what it means to be a human, uh, human being, human nature, would rather look like I am and therefore I think. But my existence, um, 
my existence is something objective. My existence is something good and holy, as as we um, have have said, and that my um, my essence. My essence is within my existence. We can kind of flesh that out a little bit as we go. But let's look at this. I think, therefore I am, bases this idea of the soul upon um, my actualization, my understanding of myself. When we did this presentation live, I asked kind of our, our, those who were all present, you know, what defines the soul? When would you say somebody has a soul? How would you... What words would you say to describe the soul? And maybe people said um, heartbeat, brain activity, personality. Um, all of these would be wrong. <laughs> they can be indicators that a person is there, but they cannot uh, by themselves define a soul. To say that somebody has a soul when they have personality, this is the I think, therefore I am. What about the person in the vegetative state who's been in a car crash? Um, you know, our, our culture a lot of the times wants to say, well, you know, their soul has already left and we're, we're just keeping their body alive. You know, oof, are we? Is that how we're defining the soul? So when we go about it, I think, therefore I am, we can kind of go, you know, it's like I decide who I am. We would call this in philosophy a very existential, um, philosophical uh, um, manner of thinking. So that rather than saying my... Um, my uh, basically existentialism says my existence precedes my essence so that some I can exist but then as I live I begin to define myself and my essence comes from me um, and I get to define who I am I define who my soul is um, I decide who I am I define who I am just kind of as we said and rather here for, for our purposes, what this can kind of lead to is we decide when somebody is a person based upon brain activity or lack thereof. But we would describe the soul in very different ways. What I'm trying to get here, and again, I, I, need, to, I need to really brush up on some philosophy to dive deeper into Descartes here. Um, but what I'm getting at is that the soul here is defined either by me or defined by us collectively. But rather, we're going to say, the Catholic Church says, no, the soul is not defined or comes into existence when somebody has personality or you can point to it and say, that's when, that's when you know, somebody has a soul. The soul is not personality. The soul is not uh, thought itself. These are things that come from having a soul, but it's not the soul itself. So let's look at what is it, uh, what is a soul? This is from the Catechism, um, paragraph 363. In sacred scripture, the term soul often refers to human life or the entire human person. But soul also refers to the innermost aspect of man, that which is of greatest value in him, that by which he is most especially in God's image. Soul signifies the spiritual principle in man. So what we're getting at here, you know, is um, that, that first, you know, highlighted yellow there. Um, soul refers to the human life. To, be, to, to have a soul means that you are alive. We would teach um, that everything that is alive has a soul. Plants have souls, we, vegetative souls. Um, they're, they're, they're not rational, obviously, they can't think. But there, there is a soul there, there's a principle of life. That you put all the biological parts together... Um, but you still need that, that spark of life, so to speak. Uh, you know, we believe animals have souls, um, not immortal souls, not rational souls, and that, you know, human beings, obviously, we believe have souls, uh, rational souls, immortal souls, um, created by God. And so what we're getting at here is that the definition of a soul, this is following, this is some philosophy, you're following Aristotle's uh, teaching is that the soul is the form of the person. Uh, the soul is the essence of the person. So, you know, think back, um, you know, if you ever read Frankenstein when you were in middle school or something, or, or obviously you're familiar with it through Halloween or on TV, um, Dr. Frankenstein could assemble all the parts of this dead body 
um, but he still didn't have life. Um, and of course, this is a bad, it, it's not a perfect analogy. You know, he used electricity to bring him back to life. Um, you know, we, we don't believe the soul is electricity. It's something, um, something, something different. Uh, but it help, might help the understanding that we believe the soul is the principle of life. It defines, um, you know, it, 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 it is, refers to human life for the entire human person, as it says here. Going on uh, in, the, in the Catechism, paragraph 364, it says, The human body shares in the dignity of the image of God, as we've said. It is a human body precisely because it is animated by a spiritual soul. And it's the whole human person that is intended to become, in the body of Christ, a temple of the Spirit. It's a human body precisely because it is animated by a spiritual soul. When you have a cadaver, somebody who has died, we wouldn't say that's a human body, not according to our philosophy of thinking. We would say that that's a, that's a body. Um, it's, a, it's a conglomeration of different biological parts that are, at this point, decaying. Um, but it doesn't have a soul. It doesn't have the spark or the principle of life. It doesn't have the form of who the person is. So now that we've kind of understood body and soul, uh, according to the, the teaching of the church, the understanding in her, in her ancient wisdom here, let's go back to this quote of what does it mean to be a person. If you see here, I've highlighted all these different things in red. You know, in these four ways, he is in the image of God. In his own nature, he unites the spiritual and material worlds. He is created. God established him. All of this goes to show that being a person is something objective. It's something concrete and real. Um, it's not something that is subjective. So a quick thing from that is, would be to say, you know, this piece of paper is white. That's an objective fact. It, 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 um, my opinion about it doesn't change the objective fact that this paper is white. A subjective fact would be, um, I don't like this piece of paper because it's not the shade of white that I like. It's not eggshell white or something. That would be subjective. No, but we define a person objectively um, to where in our culture today, it's becoming a pretty subjective approach to what does it mean to be a person. So both at the beginning of life, saying, well, no, this is not a person, it's just a clump of cells, to the end of life as well. Somebody with, um, like I said, in a vegetative state, somebody um, who has severe, severe dementia, um, you know, even to the poor uh, who don't have resources, Either we're saying they're not persons at all, or we're, we're leaning towards that, saying, well, you know, they're not, um, they're, they're losing attributes of what it means to be a person. No, we have to understand, to be a person means all these four things, and that he has a body and soul together, and the soul defined as the principle of life, that gives us the capacity to love, that gives us the capacity to enter into relationship. It's something, the soul is what gives us, it's a, it's a greater than the sum of the parts of this, our biological makeup. So to be a person is something objective. So now let's look at the teaching of the Catholic Church specifically regarding abortion. This is from the Catechism, paragraph 200, uh, excuse me, 2270. Human life must be respected and protected absolutely from the moment of conception, period. This is what we believe, and hopefully what we just went through helps us to understand why that is. You see, we don't just protect life from the moment of conception because we say, well, you know, that's just the beginning of the process, and so, you know, don't, don't meddle in the process. No. At the point when sperm and egg come together, there is, and biologically, um, you know, any, any scientist uh, will tell you this, that a new being comes into place, uh, comes into existence, rather. You know, the mother has her own DNA, but from the moment of conception, this one-celled person, this one-celled living being, has unique DNA, completely unique. We would say there was a substantial change that happened there. So just as 
Um, you know, substantial change, think back to, you know, middle school science. Um, you know, you take a log, you, you, you put it on fire, and it turns into ash. You know, the log is something that it's no longer wood, but it's turned into ash. There's a substantial change. When a sperm and an egg come together, um, both of those are corrupted. It's no longer an egg, it's no longer sperm, but it's something completely new. Um, with unique DNA, it's a separate form of life, separate from the father and the mother. Any, any biologist will tell you this, that it is, it is life um, that is unique. Um, and so, how do we define a person in the Catholic Church? A person is in the image of God, body and soul. The soul defined as the principle of life. So here we have, um, we have a new life form that has a body of one cell and has the principle of life. It has a soul. The quote there, as you can see, goes on, from the first moment of his existence, a human being must be recognized as having the rights of a person. And th this is why, because it has a body and a soul. The soul being defined as that principle of life, the form of the, bo the, form of the person, the form of what it is, that it's more than just biology. Just as I'm more than just a clump of cells. Um, biologically, yes, you can say I'm a clump of cells, but I have life. I have the principle of life, the form of who Father Kevin is, of who I am. That's my soul. This is the can be said the same here. Um, and it's interesting, too, to say, you know, it's... Um, the, the, the main arguments, of course, you know, like, okay, there's no personality, there's no heartbeat, um, there's no brain activity, you know, nothing's even formed yet. Well, you know, looking at it from a purely philosophical point of view, that argument doesn't hold um, because it's, you know, the form of the body, does that necessitate personhood? Are you only a person when you're fully formed? Because babies are not born fully formed. Um, the, the time that we had the live presentation, you know, there were there was a few babies in the audience, so toddlers, I said, you know, um, we have some toddlers in the audience. They look different than me. They are not fully formed. They're three foot high, right? <laughs> and I'm, I'm 5'10". Um, we would say between me and a toddler, there is a difference in form, but we have the same nature. This is the exact same thing with what we have here. A human being who's only one cell, very different form, you know, um, one cell versus you know, oh gosh, I don't know, billions of cells, uh, but the same nature, body and soul united. This is from Scripture, Jeremiah chapter 1, famous verse, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately wrought in the depths of the earth. This image here is an image of a, of a child uh, miscarried at 11 weeks old. Um, and as you can see, you know, it's uh, um, obviously you can, you can tell, you know, the, the beauty of this, this body that's forming. Um, but when this, uh, you know, when, when this child was alive in the womb, that it had a soul, it had the principle of life, it had a life that was completely unique and separate from the body of the mother. And again, they're having a soul. And because it's body and soul, it's a person, and therefore afforded all the rights of a person. This next slide. This next slide I want to show um, just a little bit that, uh, you know, the, the church, the Catholic Church has taught this from the very beginning. Christianity has taught this from the very, very beginning. Um, this is from the Catechism 2271. Since the first century, the Church has affirmed the moral evil of every procured abortion. This teaching has not changed and remains unchangeable. Direct abortion, that is to say abortion willed either as an end or a means, is gravely contrary to the moral law. And then in the Catechism it quotes a document called the Didache, which according to um, you know, historical scholars was either written by um, the apostles themselves or by their immediate predecessors, um, this document of the early teaching of the church. So it says in one, one line, you shall not kill the embryo by abortion and shall not cause the newborn to perish. Um, sadly, many of our 
Christian brothers and sisters, um, even s th since this teaching has been held since the first century, um, have uh, let go of that teaching and, and have, have begun to understand that they can have abortions. Um, and primarily that goes back to, well, it's not a person or there's, there's certain um, instances in which you need to, to consider. And, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But the church approaches it as this. This here, this here is a quote from Gaudium et Spes, a document of the church from the Second Vatican Council. It says, God, the Lord of life, has entrusted to men the noble mission of safeguarding life. And men must carry it out in a manner worthy of themselves. Life must be protected with the utmost care from the moment of conception. Of course, abortion and infanticide are, are wrong, it says. But when the church is talking about safeguarding life, who is it talking about? When I asked that in the live audience, many people said the baby. Yes, but also the mother, the father, anybody else on planet Earth. <laughs> if you are a person, the church is entrusted with this noble mission of safeguarding life. Every single life. Pope John Paul II has this quote from one of his docu uh, documents when he was, uh, when he was um, um, uh, in his long, I think, 25-year reign. But he had this, uh, this quote, that human persons are willed by God. They are imprinted with God's image. And their dignity does not come from the work they do, but from the persons they are. You see the objectiveness of what it means to be a person. Their dignity comes from who they are, not what they do. And we have to understand that on every level in, in, within uh, the eyes of the Catholic Church. That the dignity of a person doesn't come from somebody being successful or nice or funny or, um, or, or lovely or kind. The dignity of a person comes from their objective nature. If they are a person, if they are body and soul together, they have intrinsic, beautiful dignity that we always must safeguard. So that leads us to this conclusion, the church would say each human life has intrinsic value and is to be protected and cared for. Now who are we talking about here? Each human life has intrinsic value. The baby. So we believe that's a person, as we've established, but also the mother. The church approaches this when she's, um, you know, uh, uh, I'm going to talk about this in a little bit, at a Catholic hospital, they have to follow something called the ethical and religious directives. And one of the things in there is basically saying that whenever a pregnant woman steps into your Catholic hospital, is talking to doctors and nurses, whenever a pregnant woman steps into your hospital, you have two patients, not just one, not just the baby, not just the mother, both. There are two persons, two people there. So this is the great dignity of what it means to be Catholic. What it truly means to be pro-life is that we are safeguarding every single life because each life has great dignity and value. Now, to, to finish up here, let's look at a few very um, difficult cases and how we would kind of explain this. So a case of rape. This case is very difficult. Um, for one, it's something very horrific, tragic, that when a woman is raped, my gosh, it's something extremely unfair. Obviously, she didn't choose it, and you can't imagine the trauma that, that she goes through, um, even if she doesn't remember it, but this feeling of being violated, um, I, I, can't, I can't imagine that. Um, but what would we say that if she does conceive from this pregnancy, is we would say the same thing. Each human life has intrinsic value and is to be protected and cared for. Number one, the mother. We as the church need to be ready to step up to serve her, to get her the help that she needs, to provide her with support, with counseling, uh, with, with um, so many different resources that we could offer her. But we also have to understand that there's another person there. Objectively, there's another person there. And the church would say, you can't 
undo or fix violence by more violence. This woman was raped. Now you want to go and tragically end innocent life. That's not a way to fix the problem. Now, many people would hold up to say, would it not be traumatic for this woman to carry for nine months the fruit of this great horrific event that, that she wants to forget about, you know, and that you're going to force her to give birth um, to something that she never consented to? You know, we know we have to say this is unfair. This is an unfair thing. Uh, but we also have to acknowledge that this other person is there, and it's not this child's fault that it was conceived through rape. Um, that, you know, we, we need to be there to provide help for the mother, as I said, but also to provide, um, you know, help for that child. Of course, bringing it to life, supporting the mother through her pregnancy, um, and then, you know, having families ready to adopt, having agencies ready to be able to, to provide great care to this child and to the mother together. Um, there's many stories. Noe, our youth minister, gave, gave a great witness of somebody he knew that was um, raped and, uh, and was conceived a child. And she decided to bring that child to full term. Uh, and, and that um, he is now, she had a son, that he is now about 30 years old, um, a, a wonderful man. Um, you know, it's, it's, we have to believe that, that, you know, we have a God who takes horrific things and brings good out of them. That's what we believe as Christians. Primarily, we see that with the crucifix, the crucifixion, that Jesus was brutally, horrifically, excruciatingly crucified. And that from that came the greatest good. Um, God is a master at taking what is evil, turning it upside down, and bringing good out of it. Um, and according to the witness that Noe shared of this, this woman that he knew that, that she goes, she's now a pro-life advocate, and shares that, yes, she was violated, Something was very unfairly done to her. Um, but she doesn't regret her son. And it's not her son's fault that he was conceived through rape. And that he has brought her great joy. She, she, um, she didn't keep him. He was given up for adoption. But she kept in contact with the family and with her son. Um, and has brought great value to her life. And she was able to go on in her career and her normal life. She got married. And a new life has been brought into the world. Great beauty brought out of a horrific event. This is how the church would, would approach this case. Another one that's raised of difficulty is a case of incest. And really, we, we, would, uh, we would provide you know, very, the, very much the same logic here. You know, each human life has intrinsic value and is to be protected and cared for. Uh, the life of the mother. You know, what can we do for this woman who, who have experienced incest? Number one, the thing we probably need to get her out of whatever situation she's in with this incest. Um, we need to pr provide support for her, um, new housing, um, you know, counseling. But we also have another life here, another person who deserves the same type of um, respect and support. And, th and that's what we need to be ready to provide. One thing I'm going to go back, I forgot to mention very briefly um, uh, about the, the case of rape is that um, you know, we, there, there's a medication that many may be familiar with called Plan B or emergency contraceptives. Um, you know, and that's typically what's given to, to women who have experienced rape. And what that, what that medication does, again, I'm not a doctor, but just from a, the little training that I've had, what that medication does is it, it keeps a woman from ovulating so that an egg does not come down into the fallopian tubes um, to then be fertilized. You know, um, sperm can live within the womb for up to six days if the conditions are right. Um, and so this medication would keep a woman from ovulating. Now, the only problem with that, however, is that if conception has already occurred, that drug then renders the womb inhabitable, and it, and it um, ends up being an abortion. That drug will kill uh, the person already conceived. And so the Catholic Church has some problems with that because, you know, we, again, um, we, we don't want to directly kill, uh, you know, somebody who has great worth and dignity uh, because they're a human person, they're a human being. However, there, there are methods to be able to um, determine, has this woman ovulated? 
If she hasn't, if we can be proved that she has not ovulated within the, the last day or two, um, then the, the, according to our morality, uh, you know, this emergency contraceptive could be given in that case. Even though the Catholic Church doesn't believe in contraceptives, of, you know, um, it could be given in a case of rape. Because at this point, you know, you know, sex has the two ends, the, the marital embrace of both babies and bonding, the unitive and the procreative. In a case of rape, that's all gone, right? Um, the, the, certainly the unitive is gone. There is no uh, love shared. There is no harmony. Um, and so because of that, um, a woman would have the right to protect herself from the procreative if it has not already occurred. Now, if it has, then we have another patient that we're dealing with who, who, uh, who needs our support and our help, and, and we will be there to support them and help them, both mother and child. We have to look at them equally. Now, finally, to kind of wrap up in, in uh, the kind of special cases here, what about the life of the mother? There are times in which, um, and there's many multiple reasons for this, that uh, there will be complications with the pregnancy, and it will be impossible to save both mother and baby. It's quite a conundrum. So, what do you do? Now, what I want to do is look at our basic thing. Each human life has intrinsic value and is to be protected and cared for to the extent that it is possible. We can only do what we can do. And so the teaching of the church here, you know, for one, each human life has value. We're going to protect. We're going to try our best to save the life of the mother. But we're also going to try our best to save the life of the child. But when that's impossible... The church says we cannot directly end a human life. So to explain that, I want to use the most common uh, situation here, which would be an ectopic pregnancy. An ectopic pregnancy, as you can see here, um, is that we have um, we have uh, instead of you know the the. Um, the fetus, or excuse me, the, the ovum being fertilized, it, it should, uh, it, usually it's released from the ovaries, and then that's usually fertilized somewhere here in the fallopian tubes, and then it moves its way down into the womb to where it latches on to the utero lining and is then able to grow full formed. Um, and so um, we, in an ectopic pregnancy, excuse me, in an ectopic pregnancy, what we have going on here, rather, is that an egg is released, it's fertilized, but then it takes, um, it, it, it attaches to the fallopian tube in some way. So you can see the problem here, that eventually this, this child is going to grow, and the fallopian tube can't hold it, so there's going to be a rupture. That the fallopian tube, um, with, you know, with moral certainty, is going to to break open and there's going to be internal bleeding certainly the the child's life will be lost because it, it, this rupture would happen very very early in the pregnancy um, and you know the the uh, it wouldn't have reached the, the the child would not have reached the state of viability outside of the womb outside of the mother and obviously the woman's life is going to be in danger because there's this un internal bleeding um, and so what can be done here because according to our current te technology or current medical practices that we have, um, you can't save both in, in this situation. It's, uh, we, we don't have the technology for it. Um, you know, it'd be ideal if somehow we could extract the child and put them in some type of incubator that where they could be held for the next seven months or something. Um, but but that we, we, we can't do that. So what do we do um, with all of this? One possible solution is a direct abortion to where we would go in and we would directly end the life of that person, directly end the life of that fetus. Um, that certainly solves the problem in terms of saving the life of the mother, uh, but it does, of course, there, it, it's, it's great disrespect and it's, it's, um, we are ending innocent life, deliberately ending innocent life. Rather, this is what the church proposes is that we have the ectopic pregnancy, but what if instead of going in and directly, um, instead of going in and directly eliminating this life and intentionally going after it and killing 
and aborting that life, what if we went in and simply cut this part of the fallopian tube out? Now think about that. What's going to happen? The life of the mother will be saved. That fallopian tube will be sewn back up. Um, you know, it's it's obviously can't be used in the future, but there there's, you know, God willing, the, the other one on the other side. Um, but obviously what's going to happen with the child is that it will die. Um, but do you see the difference? That we're not going in and directly killing um, a human being, but rather we're using in morality what we would call the principle of double effect. That there are two effects to this. You know, one is we're saving the life of the mother. Um, and the other effect is that the child dies, but that's an an effect that is not intended. We didn't deliberately intend for this to happen. The good doesn't come about by means of the child's death. The good came about by removing a part of the fallopian tube which had the child in it. Um, and so this is how the church would approach this. Um, you know, it's, and it's, it goes back to that saying that the, the means don't justify the ends, the ends don't justify the means. That both of these have the same end is that the mother's life is saved and the baby has, has died, but the means is very important because both mother and child deserve great respect and have intrinsic value and dignity that we must respect. And this is the best way to respect that dignity of the human person that is within her fallopian tube. Um, an example I used in the live presentation was, uh, if you've ever seen the movie Master and Commander with Russell Crowe, he's a naval, naval captain in, uh, of uh, the British naval ship, um, and this is in the 1700s. Great movie. It's one of my absolute favorites. But there's a moment in when there's the storm, or excuse me, the, uh, the ship is in this huge hurricane. And it's being tossed about, and it's, it, it's, uh, the ship is breaking apart, practically. Um, they need to get the sails up so that it's not being blown around so much. And so a crew member goes up the mast, and he's pulling up the sails. Well, unfortunately, a wind comes through. I forget exactly. It'd be cool if I could put the scene here. Um, but the mast breaks off, and down with it goes the crewman into the sea. Now, the, bla the, the mast does a clean break but it's still attached to the ship by means of probably like a dozen different ropes. You know, there's so many ropes on those old ships. And the crew member is out there drowning. Um, and his only salvation is to swim to the wreckage of the mast. Um, but unfortunately, that mast begins to act as a sea anchor for the ship, and it begins to pull the ship into danger, into danger of sinking. And so the whole crew would perish. So here we have kind of the same thing of like, we have, you can't save both. You can't save the crew member and save the ship, but you can save one. And so what they don't do is, you know, to, you know, end the suffering of this guy or something. They don't pull out a gun and shoot him in the water. Um, no, they, they, uh, they take axes and it's a hard, hard decision. And you can see it in Russell Crowe's face. I forget the character's name. Um, as they have to chop away at these ropes that are holding the mast in place, the salvation of the crew member. Uh, but this is kind of the idea here. I hope I did a good job explaining that. Look it up on YouTube. Um, it's, it's, it's a very helpful understanding there. So finally to end, I just want to look at one final quote. This is a quote from the Social Compendium of the Catholic Church, uh, of Social Doctrine, excuse me. And I want to read it in full because it is amazing. It says this, The Church sees in men and women, in every person, the living image of God himself. This image finds, and must always find, an ever deeper and fuller unfolding of itself in the mystery of Christ, the perfect image of God the one who reveals God to man and man to himself. And it is to these men and women who have received an incomparable and inalienable dignity from God himself that the church speaks, rendering to them the highest and most singular service, constantly reminding them of their lofty vocation so that they may always be mindful of it and worthy of it. 
Christ, the Son of God, by his incarnation, has united himself in some fashion with every person. For this reason, the Church recognizes as her fundamental duty the task of seeing that this union is continuously brought about and renewed. In Christ the Lord, the Church indicates and strives to be the first to embark upon the path of the human person, and she invites all people to recognize in everyone, near and far, known and unknown, we would add to that born and unborn, above all in the poor and the suffering, a brother or sister for whom Christ died. I love that quote because it's lifting up the great dignity of every single human person. These beings that are body and soul put together and are made in the very image of God and that God in the person of his son, the second person of the blessed trinity, took on our nature and has glorified it even more. The church is saying we are here to lift up every single person from the moment of conception when that life begins, to the moment of natural death, when that soul is radically ruptured from the body. And then we believe in the future resurrection that we will all be united with our bodies and made human beings fully, once again, in the image of Jesus Christ. So when we say we are pro-life, my friends, that means we are pro-life for every single person on the face of this planet. And specifically in these difficult cases, we are pro-life for mother and baby and Father, that we need to approach all of this equally and to understand the great dignity of who we are, that we are created in the image of God, and that our dignity comes from, as John Paul II said, not from the work that we do, not from our personality, not from our acts of kindness or acts of hate or whatever they may be. Our dignity comes from the persons we are, meaning objectively that we are made in the image of God. And that includes the unborn, that includes those who are in vegetative states at the end of life, that includes the poor and the suffering whom we might tend to look down upon, and that includes you too. Thank you guys so, so very much uh, for listening for this presentation. I hope it is helpful. Um, please um, let me know if you have any questions. Um, I would be more than happy to answer them. May God bless you and may God keep us all in his care. May we all come to see the great dignity of every single human life. Goodbye for now.